I am delighted to welcome Sebastian Barry to Politics and Prose. Uh, his new novel, Days Without End, won the Costa Book Award in, in excuse me, 2016, uh, and this fall was long listed for the Man Booker. It is a beautiful, poetic, haunting, and mesmerizing tale of one Irish immigrant, Thomas McNulty, and his escape from the famine to America. There, he is witness firsthand to the expansion and tearing apart of the nation, fighting endlessly in the Indian and Civil Wars, while creating his own version of a family with his close friend John Cole and adopted Indian daughter Winona. It is a breathtaking vision of a man and country falling apart and being made anew. As The Guardian says, it is a work of staggering openness. Its startlingly beautiful sentences are so capacious that they are hard to leave behind. Its narrative so propulsive that you must move on. So please join me in welcoming Sebastian Barry. Well, there, I was lying in my um, incredibly beautiful bed in the Jefferson Hotel. What an invention. I, I was hoping they might incarcerate me and never let me go again. <laughs> and even more excitingly, reading um, a new book by uh, a great authority on, on liberalism called Edward Luce, and thinking, my god, these are crystalline sentences I'm looking at. Um, and I was thinking, as I do, in my confused way, of Cicero and uh, how challenging times need great sentences written in proper English. And then I was running um, down through your city, my favorite city in America, because of that magical ordinance not to build higher than the, the monument. Um, and I thought, well, I'm 62. Hopefully, I'll make it as far as Mr. Lincoln. It was, you know, for it's quite a quite a run. Got down there, saluted Mr. Lincoln, came back up, uh, skirted the White House a little bit, skirted. Uh, tried not to utter my mother's curse. My mother was a white witch, so if I have bad thoughts about somebody, I have to be careful not to let them get out of my head. Uh, and came back thinking of empires thinking, uh, because, you know, as a stranger wandering in to America yet again, um, and as a student of Latin at Trinity College, inevitably your mind goes to th the span of time and what time does inevitably to all great enterprises, and uh, Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and how Rome, in all its splendiferous marble beauty became eventually a little village again in, in Latium with, with cattle in, in the forum, do you know? And, and although it'll be many hundreds of years hence, no doubt too in the usual story of a man, men and women's efforts, Washington itself may become, you know, a very delightful rural village again. <laughs> Uh, with these incredible buildings beautifully destructed and decayed, and it'll be a, somebody will write the history of that. This this little book, I went down to see Mr. Lincoln uh, in in his beautiful largeness si sitting there because um, in my reading for this book, and I, as I, in my effort to retrieve my ancestor from the dead cold hand of history. And because I only had half a sentence about him, which was my grandfather saying that his great uncle was at the Indian Wars, I, I have to read the history to concoct a fake uh, autobiography for this man. And in my reading, I mean, Thomas McNulty leaves Ireland because his family, in another inevitability of history, has died from the Irish famine, has died on the stone floor of their house, his sister, his mother, and, the, and eventually his father. And he has sneaked onto uh, a boat uh, uh, to 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 rescue himself from from that. And because I was thinking of hunger and famine, um, it, it astonished me how much hunger and famine and famishing there was in America in the 1850s and 1860s. Uh, in particular, in a little incident in this book. This little history, you know, I make no claims for it, but it's what I wrote in my little workroom in Wicklow. 
there's a little moment where, where they're in Andersonville, the concentration camp or the camp, prisoner of war camp, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, reading about it, where you realize that not only were the prim prisoners turning into um, skeletons, the Union prisoners, uh, in f a, a thing that for Thomas means that he can never again be on stage dressed as a woman because it takes his beauty away. Um, and not only were they turning into skeletons, and there are photographs. Strangely enough, there are no photographs of the Irish famine. There is not one. There is not one. And yet, just a, a decade or two later, the Civil War is, is highly photographed, and there are these men. But not only are the men famishing, but the guards are turning into skeletons. There is simply no food in the South. There is no food for the Confederate Army, and yet they fight on and on and on past that point. And as everyone knows, an army marches on its stomach. So these things, you know, as a foreign person from far away reading this history, whether it's reliable or not, that sort of thing was raging out at me, followed closely by the fact that when they tried to make an exchange of prisoners, Lincoln said, I don't want skeletons, which just somehow shattered me in that little house in Wicklow. Um, because, of course, he couldn't put them back into uniform to fight in the army. Um, these things may not seem like very useful <laughs> uh, fragments to make a book from, but it makes you think that some men, some are, men are very great, with, with very great capacities that have tiny streaks of incapacity, moments where they, where, where they let their greatness down. And yet there seem to be other men uh, who are just mostly evil, and then they have this tiny tincture of goodness in them. So it's a reverse uh, case. Thomas McNulty is just a surviving man. He just wishes to go on living. He lives in a world where there are no social services. There's no, there's no uh, Walmart or there's nowhere to go and get food. And I, the first passage I want to read for you is just uh, a necessary action they have to undertake when they're troopers in the army, which is to provision the men. And uh, so they have to engage in an activity I'm sure you've all, as good Americans, have engaged in, which is buffalo hunting. <laughs> I'm sure you're all great experts. So you can correct me afterwards. It's not like that, you know, when you for it. The, the great um, proponent and poet of the buffalo hunt in, is a man called Francis Parkman. I'm hoping some of you know who that is. He was considered in his day to be the first great American historian. And he's an absolutely beautiful writer. He was a Boston Brahmin family. And he, he had the tragedy of choosing the wrong subject for his great magnum opus, which was of the obscure border wars between the French, the, Indian, uh, the Indians, the English, the Americans. He wanted to write a history of Native America, but he thought no one would be interested in it. So I think that was his tragedy. But in the midst of this tragedy, he wrote On the Oregon Trail, which I highly recommend as a most beautifully written, uh, rather fabulously written, actually, book. Uh, and in that is A Buffalo Hunt. And in reading that, I thought that maybe I had some chance to be able to concoct a history for Thomas, because he had a tiny detail in it, which is when you're riding down a buffalo on, on horseback, just when you think everything's set up and you're going to get your shot in, the buffalo has a, a way of running suddenly sideways at you to try and get you first. And somehow in the magic of that moment, I thought, well, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do this book. Um, so I'll read that little bit. And then, uh, as Keith mentioned, these two men are in love with each other in a way that's hard to describe now because the words gay, all the rest of it, didn't exist then. What they are is sort of originals, I think. Uh, and um, they, they meet under a hedge in, in a rainstorm when they're children. They stay together for the rest of their lives, Thomas and John Cole. And in the course of the catastrophe of the Indian Wars, the erasure of these people, not unlike Thomas himself, they rescue from this, in their minds, a young Lakota Sioux girl, and take her as, her servant, take her as their servant initially, but she becomes their daughter. And uh, the second bit I'll read is just a tiny bit about that. And maybe then we might reach the, the Civil War. God help us. <laughs> right. Um, if I live that long. 
my friend Donald McCann, great Irish actor, who was in The Dead. Did you ever see The Dead? John Huston's film. He played Gabriel. We did a play together years ago called The Steward of Christendom, uh, which if anyone else had been in it, probably wouldn't have been the success it was. And he literally bought us our house through the proceeds of that magical thing. But he always said, if you're not, if you haven't died halfway through the sentence, you're not doing it right. So there you go. I'm always expecting to be slightly posthumous at the end of a read. <laughs> okay, or wholly posthumous. Uh, yeah. Now even worse, the ho this whole story is darkening because I'm going to have to sing for a few seconds. So, so brace yourself, Bridget's and, and Michael's. Uh, it's going to be very painful just for a little bit. Uh, because one of the great songs um, of America, I think, one of the great singers of America, in my mind, was Ralph Stanley, who died recently, aptly described as the Maria Callas of, blue so of, of bluegrass. And when he's singing, I was talking about this on BBC Three recently, the classical program, because I did a little interview with a great man called Michael Berkeley, And I was so happy to introduce Ralph Stanley into BBC Three, classical music. <laughs> Or, uh, because uh, when you're listening to Stanley singing, y you don't know how he's doing it, which is the mark of a great singer. You will never be able to do that, uh, because what he's doing is proper, like uh, the song of the robin is proper to the robin. This singing is proper to Ralph Stanley. Of course, he invented the claw hammer style of the banjo. These are great, in a way, Scots-Irish achievements, because, as you may know, the Scots-Irish in Ireland were as much put upon by the penal laws as the Catholics were. And they got totally fed up with that, so they shoved on here, crossed down Virginia, went up into the mountains, Smoky Mountains, as far up as they could get, and just decided to remove themselves from the scene and write their songs. And one of these songs is the song, O Death, which I'll sing first, which is sort of inspiration, because the whole business of this book is avoiding death. Come on, Ralph. Um, So what is this that I can't see? Blind in my eye, taking hold of me, a hobbling my tongue till I can talk, spanceling my leg till I can walk. Oh, death. Oh, Ooh, won't you spy me over for another year? So what happens the next day was me and John Cole and Watchhorn himself and also a nice son of a bitch called Pearl, we went up with the scouts to find that herd. We came into marshy ground first, but the Shawnee boys knew the way through and we weaved it along it content enough. Cook had put some of his cooked sparrows in our stomachs. We were after something bigger. Shawnees seemed to remember one of them was called bird songs, it happens. Cool-minded timber-skin boys they were, giving themselves the old information in their own lingo. Had done up their prayer bags the night before, kind of lucky charms they liked to put together in an old bag made from the scrotum of a buffalo. They were lashed to their ponies' necks now. They rode without saddles. Long before we had news of it, they were going slower. They knew something was close. They brought us about a mile sideways so we could start to work in up the wind. There was a big, low, sickle-shaped hill before us, covered in a dark grass, and the country there was quiet and almost windless, except for a sound you were guessing might be the sound of the sea. There was no sea thereabouts, we knew. Then we breasted the hill. It was giving a horizon of maybe four miles... And I drew in my breath amazed because right down below us was a herd of maybe two or three thousand buffalo. They must have taken a vow of silence that morning. <laughs> Shawnees now were putting their ponies into a polite trotting and ourselves likewise. We were to go down as close to the buffalo as we could without stirring them. Maybe buffalo isn't the smartest chicken in the coop. We had the wind in our faces such as it was. We knew as soon as they felt us there was going to be fireworks. Sure enough, the nearest dozen must have felt us. They started to stumble forward all of a sudden, nearly falling down. We must have smelled like death to them. We hoped we did. Birdsong kicked forward and we kicked forward. John Cole was a beautiful rider. 
He streaked through the Indians and fled after the biggest cow he could spot. I had a line on a big cow too. Must have been that we preferred the cow meat. Then the land dipped again. The near buffalo had set everything moving. It was 10,000 hooves then drumming the hard earth and the whole cavalcade pouring down into a declivity. Seemed to swallow them, every last one. Then the ground rose in front of us and there they were again, the flood of buffalo, like a big boil of black molasses in a skillet, surging up. Goddamn blackberries they were as black as. My cow had taken a wild run to the right. She was gearing herself to go through her comrades. I don't know if an angel hadn't given her a message I was on her tail. You gotta treat a buffalo like a killer, like a rattlesnake on legs. She wants to kill you before you kill her. She wants to lure you on too, and then she wants to suddenly run sideways at you, knock down your horse in full flight, and then come back before Saturday and stamp you to death. You never want to fall to the ground on a buffalo hunt if I can just instruct you in that. My cow won't act out of character, but I got to get myself in close, get a shot into her head as best I can. It's no easy task to keep your rifle raised and ready when your horse was seeming to be an aficionado of every goddamn rabbit hole out there. He better keep his footing. Maybe we are moving at 30, 40 miles an hour now. Maybe we are sheeting along like the wind. Maybe the herd is making a noise like a great storm coming down from the mountains. But my heart was up. And I couldn't care what happened unless I could get my bullet into her. Blooms in my head the picture of the troopers roasting her and cutting great steaks out of her, the blood running down the meat. Well, I am caterwauling now, and I see the other Shawnee, now nameless in my memory. He is riding down a most splendid bull. He is sitting back on his pony Indian style, and he is shooting arrows into the bull, who is only a raging, roaring mass of meat and hair. That sight vanishes in a vanishing second. My own task is at hand. Sure enough, she makes a brilliant-minded lunge sideways at me, just as I think I'm steady to strike. But my horse isn't the first time out against Buffalo, and he skips to the right like a good dancer. And now we have drawn a bead on that cow, and I fire, and the lovely orange flame shoots the bullet forth, and the burning black steel is absorbed into her shoulder. That girl is all shoulder. We burn along the grasses together. The herd seems to take a violent turn left, as if to escape her approaching fate. I fire again. I fire again. Then I see her right horn sort of dip down, just a half a foot. Well, glory be to God, that's the good sign. My heart swells. My pride explodes in my breast. Down, down she goes, a blaze of dust and power. And she takes 15 feet to reach a stop. Must have pierced her heart. That's a dead buffalo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Years, 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 and years ago, in my own days without end, which is a phrase Thomas uses to describe that time in your life, maybe 20, 25 years of, of time, when your children are small as may be, and you're young, and it's terrifying hard work. I mean, digging ditches and minding babies, they're the two worst things you can do in life. <laughs> but you're distracted by this pressure in you to make something uh, work for your kids and all the rest of it. And they're the high days of your life, that's frankly put. They are the paradisical time. And he, he, he's very aware of that. In my own time, and in fact, writing this book happened as a sort of signal, uh, answering the signal of my last child, Toby, going to university. And the book is dedicated to, to Toby. Um, this little passage I'm going to read stems from something that seems small, remote, unimportant, but to me uh, is the equivalent of I'm sure the lovely feeling Seamus had when he got his Nobel Prize. And it was an evening in Ireland that was of great rarity. Uh, it's about 22 years ago. It was a thing called a hot summer's night, which we get every 32 years now. <laughs> so nobody had any pajamas on. Uh, me and Ali were in the bed. The twins were in their cot, uh, waking each other up as may be. And Dolly, my daughter, who now glories in the title of mixed martial arts and boxing correspondent for Metro Online in London. <laughs> she was a fierce woman, but she was only two then, but still fierce, and she wasn't well, so it was the imperative of the parent. I got out of bed, 
like 2 a.m. in the morning, already dripping with sweat from this uh, unseasonable weather, or rare weather. And, and I lifted her up, my little babalatch, and she vomited straight into my face. <laughs> um, but I wasn't wearing anything, so it was fine. It just went all around me. And, uh, and I laughed, and I thought that was so, so charming for some reason. And I stepped into the shower with her in my arms still and turned on the shower and we watched the and I put her back into bed and got into bed with Ali. And Ali said to me, and this was my Nobel Prize moment, she said, you must be a good father because you didn't get cross. Uh, that little sentence I've carried with me ever since. It's like my ticket was franked. And no matter what I did after that, somehow or other, <laughs> I was still a, what the Greeks call a kalosanthropos, a good man. If you live in a little village in Greece, you know, you could kill somebody you could rob a bank, you could destroy something, you could do all sorts of strange things, but you may still keep your original fame as a good man, Carlos Anthropos. So because, you know, you might have done something in youth that was worthwhile. Anyway, this is a um, tiny passage in the book. Thomas and John are now, I think this is in Grand Rapids. Thomas is dressing sometimes as a woman he wants to be, he feels most content and at at his ease and happy, as dressed as a woman. And they do that in great privacy. But Winona is their child, as it were, their daughter, uh, out of the chaos of this time. I mean, I don't think social services now would be too happy with this arrangement, but it's all right. Uh, th th these were other days. And, uh, and this is just about some little instance in their lives that matches, I think, my own ticket being briefly franked in Dublin years ago. And that's all you can do with a book when you don't know anything about somebody. You can only give them the little things out of your own life. And Thomas says, the point is, we living like a family. John Cole, no, he was born in December or seems to remember that month. And maybe I remember I was born in June. And Winona, Winona says she was born during the full buck moon. Anyhow. We roll all that into one, and on the 1st of May, we have assigned our birthday for the three of us. We say Winona is nine years old, and John Cole has settled on 29, so that must make me 26, something along those lines. Point is, whatever ages we be, we're young. John Cole is the best-looking man in Christendom, and this is his heyday. Winona is sure the prettiest little daughter ever man had. Goddamn beautiful black hair. Blue eyes like a mackerel's blue back, or a duck's wing feathers. Sweet little face, cool as a melon, when you hold it in your hands and kiss her forehead. God knows what stories she's seen and been part in. Savage murder for sure, because we caused it. Walked through the carnage and the slaughter of her own. You could expect a child that has seen all that to wake in the night sweating, and she does. Then John Cole is obliged to hold her trembling form against him and soothe her with lullabies. Well, he only knows one and he does that over and over. He holds her softly and sings her the lullaby. Where he got that, no man knows, not even himself, like a stray bird from some distant country. Then he lies on her bed and she pushes in tight against him like you might imagine bear cubs do in the winter hide, or maybe even wolves. Tight in like John Cole was that bit of safety she is trying to reach, a harbour. Then her breathing slowly lengthens, and then she is snoring a little. Time to come back to bed, and in the darkness, or the helpful dim of the candle, he looks at me and nods his head. Got her sleeping, he says. You sure do, I say. Not much more than that needed to make men happy. There you go. So that's a little victory in the, I mean, in an extraordinary time, I mean, to look in over the fence of, of your history, out of my own history, um, I, in, in Ireland, uh, everything we did in Ireland needed to be refashioned, restated, uh, covered with helpful, beneficent lies, told in a different way for it to be palatable. But what intrigued me about trying to do this, whether I achieved it or not, is another question, is that it's an eyewitness account, just like Francis Parkman going west 
uh, in the 1840s. It's an eyewitness account, so it's the thing itself, as, as Plato would say, to prota pragmata, which is to say the thing itself before other things are said about it. Plato said things, as you know, had an essence that was almost dissipated, almost made disappear as soon as you put a word on it, a name on it. So this isn't written in grand Parkmanesque English. This is written in the broken-mouthed, broken-backed, broken-hearted English that Thomas has achieved in his mouth. Because there's another sense that um, he, he may well have been a native speaker, you know, and uh, when he, uh, Irish speaker when he got to America. So he's listening for English. He's listening for the lingo of the place. Uh, and the book tries to track the, the gradual acquire, acquiring of American English or American English as it existed in the 1850s and the 1860s. Uh, I don't think he ever quite gets there, but he, that's what's happening to him. There's a sort of citizenship I in the syntax, if you know what I mean. He's trying to, because when, another thing that surprised me reading for the book was that when young Irishmen got off the boat in the 1860s, now this is after the famine, but there were still enormous amounts of um, deprivation and, and famishing in Ireland right up through those decades. They were obliged, something I didn't know, to join the Union Army, as may be, to earn their citizenship which sounds fair enough, until you think, well, these are young men, maybe 18, 19, 20, who, who have lost everything behind them in Ireland. Everything that they were going to be and everything that was going to happen to them, their entire narrative, their entire novel of themselves, as it were, the book of that individual, was rescinded and cancelled. So I, I was thinking that maybe what explains the extraordinary um, scenes of violence in the Irish-American story at that time is that those young men must have been incredibly angry somehow with the world. And that, so you put them into uniform, and they're put into a field somewhere in a place they don't know. Maybe they don't even speak English. And they're told to run down the field at another bunch of fellas coming up the field. I'm sure half of them are Irish too. So both of them are shouting out, four ballot, four ballot, each other. And you can imagine the sort of imaginative confusion, and maybe, maybe a fruitful confusion that then occurs. Um, it's not a very glorious uh, depiction of the Civil War. I, I acknowledge that. But somehow or other, this is how it seemed to me it might be for somebody like Thomas. He's just going to tell you about one particular instance of the Civil War. I'll go mad and try another song, so why not? Uh, that bed was so comfortable, it's driven me to song. I think that's what it is. Um, right. Little birdie, little birdie, why do you fly so high? It's because I am a pretty little bird, and I do not wish to die. Sense of ferocious danger then descends when we reach the spot where we must deploy. News is the boys in grey are beaded into the great line of woods that seem to rush down that country. Three long great meadows rise to a bare and blasted headland. Deep three-foot grasses such as would make a cow hurry on to partake. Our batteries are ranged in expert wise and by afternoon our sections positioned and good. Something building in the hearts of the soldiers, if you could see that thing, it might have strange wings, something fluttering in their breasts, and then a great clattering of wings. Our muskets are loaded, and where we are, a line of 50 men kneels, and another 50 stand behind, and then a loading line, and then men there, anxious and silent, ready to step forward to fill the gaps. The field guns start firing into the trees, and soon we are marveling at the explosions such as we ain't ever seen before. Fire and blackness bursts in the treetops. And then you might think the green of the forest washes forward and back to close the destructed place. All this a quarter mile off. And then we see the grey-coated soldiers appear at the raveled margin of the trees. 
captain is peering through his glass and he says something I can't hear and it's spoken back in a relay and it sounds like he is saying there be about 3,000 men. That sounds like a great number but we're just a thousand more. The yellow legs group on the top meadow and our batteries are trying to get a pin on them. Then they are getting a pin and then the rebels are moving down because there ain't nothing joyous in receiving well-served bombs. The rebels run down towards us in a fashion never expected, at least by me. And then when they come in range, the officers steady us and then call out to fire. And then we fire. Those crazy rebs go down in numbers and then, just like the forest, seem to close with green courage over the gaps of deaths. And then they keep coming on. Each line of us reloads and fires, reloads and fires. And now the rebs are firing, some by standing for a moment, some on the hoof as they hurry down. It ain't the slow march we were taught at all, but a lurching wild gallop of human creatures. You wouldn't think so many could be killed and it not stop them, and then all around us we are falling with a bullet in a face or a bullet in an arm. Those fierce little mini bullets that open in your poor soft corpse. Then the captain screams out to fix our bayonets, and then we are bid to stand, and then we are bid to charge. Of my little bunch of men, one still kneels in day's conviction, so I deftly kick him to his feet, and on we go. Now we are one heart running, but the grass is tufty and thick, and it is hard to run nobly, and we are stumbling and cursing like drunkards. But somehow, by fierce tuck of strength, we keep our feet, and suddenly it seems desirable to lock with our foe, and suddenly the grass seems no obstacle at all, and one in the company cries out, For Bala! And then there is a sound made in our throats we have never heard, and there is a great hunger to do we know not what, unless it is stick our bayonets into the rush of grey ahead, but not just that, because there is another thing, or other things we have no name for, because it is not part of usual talk. It is not like running at Indians who are not your kind, but it is running at a mirror of yourself. Those Johnny Rebs are Irish, English, and all the rest. Canter on, canter on, and enjoin. But suddenly then the Rebs swing right and turn their charge across the meadow. They've seen the great swathe of our men come up behind, and maybe seen a engine of death complete. And whatever it is, we can hear the officers calling out in the chaotic uproar. We're stopped in our charge, and kneel and load and fire. We kneel and load and fire at the side-on millipede of the enemy. Our batteries belch forth their bombs again, and the Confederates balk like a huge herd of wild horses and run back ten yards, and then ten yards reversed again. They greatly desire to reach the cover of the far woods. The batteries belch behind, they belch behind. Some bombs come so low they want to pass through us too, and many fall in our lines as a missile forges a bloody ditch through living men. A frantic weariness infects our bones. We load and fire, we load and fire. Now in the burgeoning noise, dozens of shells hit into the enemy, sharding them and shredding them. There is a sense of sudden wretchedness and disaster. Then with a great bloom, like a sudden infection of spring flowers, the meadow becomes a strange carpet of flames. The grass has caught fire and is generously burning and adding burning to burning. So dry it cannot flame fast enough, so high that the blades combust in great tufts and wash the legs of the feline soldiers, not with soft grasses but dark flames full of a roaring strength. Wounded men fallen in the furnace cry out with horror and affront, pain such as no animal could bear without wild screeching, tearing, rearing. The main body of soldiers find the mercy of the trees and their wounded are left now on the blackened earth. What is it causes the captain to halt our firing and by real aid message halt the guns? Now we are merely standing watching and the wind blows the conflagration up the meadow, leaving many a howling man and a quiet man in its wake. The quiet are in their black folds of death. Others where the fire hasn't touched are just groaning and ruined men. We are bid retire. Our surge of blue draws back 200 yards, and boys go out in gunless details from the rear. And there are the medical boys, and the chaplain too. Out from the rebel trees come similar souls likewise, and a truce is struck without a word. Muskets are thrown down both sides, and the details charge up now, not to fire and kill, but to stamp out the black acre of lingering flames, and tend the dying, the rendered, and the barn like dancers dancing on the charred grasses. Thank you.
we got through it. We survived. You think of evil questions and I'll drink a bit of water. <laughs> Devious questions that will snake in and undo me. You can, you can start with the song if you wish. <laughs> I never knew a man could resist the microphone. I'm, I apologize. In doing your research on the, uh, his transformation of language from Irish to English, how on earth did you do that? How did you trace it? Well, a beautiful, non-devious question, and it's, the answer is, I mean, it, I mean uh, oddly enough, because sometimes I, it's a wing and a prayer and you chance your arm, but I have, over the last 30 years, trying to think about this book, uh, made some effort to inform myself about the the journeys of Englishness, English, into all the different English is you can think of. For instance, I I tried to read as much as I could about so-called pidgin English, English as it, what happens to it when it reaches Africa, when it's in Nigeria, where my grandfather was uh, working years ago. Uh, what happens to English in India? What happens to English in uh, other parts of the world? Um, one of my uh, friends, uh, as it turned out, and I, uh, and I proudly claim him, wa was one of the ambassadors uh, from here to Ireland, a guy called Tom Foley, uh, uh, who, who was Republican, but I still loved him. And uh, <laughs> he, he sent me a number of books about the presence of Norfolkness, as you might call it, in America, and how a lot of the institutions of America are in a curious way still shadow versions of little local structures in, in Angli you know, East Anglia or whatever. And they brought that with them when they came first. Uh, and then I was thinking about, well, that's probably late Elizabethan, early Stuart English being brought to America. And then what happens to it when it drops out of the mouths of people into America? So it, it, was, it was, for me, a uh, surprisingly um, intense search, you know. Because as I say, I much prefer to make it up because it means you don't have to read 100 books as much quicker. But I, I, it just fascinated me because it is my belief as a writer after 40 years that if you can discover the syntax of a person, uh, then the person can be made to reappear in the world. It, just as they say that, you know, our brains are full of what is it, 100 trillion synapses, that there's no such thing as color or sound. We just have receptors who re interpret various waves coming at us to create these things. Similarly, a novel, if you just are lucky, I guess, can, can do something to the synapses in the brain and bring, bring that person before you in, in, a, in a way that is as real, maybe even more real than supposed reality. So I, my responsibility was to be true to the idea of the language. In, in the book, I noticed, after I finished it, that it starts in a certain uh, sentence structure. And at, towards the end, he asks himself the question, uh, am I an American? Uh, and he doesn't know. You know, having recounted this story of his life in America, does that make an, him an American? I think the language he's then using suggests possibly that he is. I wrote a little play called White Woman Street which really wasn't a terribly good play, but it was the first time I tried to write about him, and the first time I tried to think about what was English like when it was shared between, say, a man from England, an Irishman, uh, a Chinese-American guy from Brook Brooklyn, uh, a, a black person from the South. You know, if you were in, in a little outlaw company, how would you speak to each other? Wh what language do you then make? Because it's a creative act, isn't it? Uh, so that, that's, what I, that's what I was after. And uh, before I went to the trouble of getting it all wrong, let's say, I, 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 I read as many books as I could about it. But I think in the, at the last analysis, you're sitting there in your workroom for nine months. I was writing about the Irish famine. I thought it was OK. You know, I, I was hoping it was work of genius. But it turned out you know, to be absolutely useless. And it wasn't until he said that first sentence in the book, the method of laying out a corpse in Missouri sure took the proverbial cake, that I thought I was hearing him. So my other gimcrack, Tuppenny Hapenny belief is that they're in you somewhere, these people. You know, you share a, a genetic code with them. They're hiding somewhere in your synapses. I mean, in all those hundred trillion, surely there's a few of them belonging to Thomas or whatever his name might have been. 
so that you can trust in a way the moment in your workroom when he starts to speak and then you're, you are sort of anxiously and also in this case exuberantly listening to him and writing down what he said and that's what I trusted rather than you know the top head research that you do with a sort of anxiety of scholarship but really that's not what writes books it's a much more ancient being much deeper in the brain I think I have a very short comment and then I want to ask you a question. I'm a New Englander, so reading about the Civil War was like alien and almost taboo. Uh, living in Maryland <laughs> hasn't changed that. But So when I read your um, scenes, especially of the battles around the Rappahannock, which I, I know, but I had no idea, it was just stunning. and. Um, uh, maybe I'll read more about the Civil War. But my question had to pass. Let me just say that's oh, my sure. favorite statement so far in America. Thank you very oh. much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, your question can be dreadful now after that. You, you can't blot your copy book after that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's just about the Booker Prize. And um, for two years, they've allowed Americans in. and But also, I'm not sure whether this was the same time or a little bit before it they uh, would not allow uh, books to be considered that were, were not simultaneously published in the UK. So many, 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 many Irish terrific books were uh -huh. excluded. So uh -huh. do you have a comment, opinion? Uh, well, no matter how they organize prizes, and you know, uh, oddly enough, over the years, if you live long enough, you, I mean, my former agent, for instance, on the, is on the Booker Prize Committee. They don't have anything to do with influencing the prize, but they decide certain mm -hmm. things. There was a vote whether to include American literature, and they said everyone thought, yes, they should. And that's only a few years ago. It makes perfect sense when you think about it. Um, Booker is that moment in a writer's life when the circus arrives at the front gate <laughs> down the avenue, and the bearded lady comes up or the strongest man in the world, and says, come on with us now for a while. You're going to run away with the Booker Circus for a bit. And you go down, and you, you gladly hop aboard. You don't tell your family where you're going. <laughs> Off you go. And you know, sooner or later, uh, you know, unless you win it, uh, they're going to let you off in some rainy podunk town and say, I'm sorry now. You have to walk home from here. <laughs> so, but until that moment, w which is bitter, I mean, you're looking at a poor sap who missed the Booker Prize by one vote in 2008. You know, when it's only, <sighs> there are only five people voting, so one right, vote is a yeah, big thing. Right, yeah, right. 20%. But, you know, that was painful. And I did think at that moment, uh, well, that's that. You know, I'll just take it. I'll take it with a merry laugh and a pinch of salt from here on in, because either that's going to kill you or, you know, the mm -hmm. opposite, give you life. So I, I have a complicated relationship. I was four times nominated for it, twice mm -hmm. shortlisted. Uh, I think that's a, a sort of um, a sweet compliment, I think, because always different, different judges, and you know, it, 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 it is all about the judges. There's a lot of commentary about the Booker, and people say such and such should, should have happened, and this should happen, right, and right. he should have won, she should have been on right. it. But it, it's really about those five individual people who come together and they have that strange conversation. And, and uh, oftentimes those conversations, if you could hear them, would probably be quite alarming, sometimes inspiring, hopefully. <laughs> but you know, there's a horse trading thing that goes on. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, mm -hmm. it's the circus and the mart, as we call it in Ireland, where horses are bought and sold. So you know, it's a difficult thing. But it's essentially sort of joy, followed possibly quite quickly by, by deepest sorrow. <laughs> but you know, you, you wouldn't trade it. You, you have to go through it. Mm -hmm. Colm Tobin, my beloved brother, elder brother, since he's 10 days older than me or something, <laughs> called it recently the cruel theater of the Booker. Yeah. And Colin was all, when he was shortlisted, I think it's three times he was there and uh, always felt, he says, sort of shame, hurry back to, back to Dublin having been defeated again. Mm -hmm. But I never felt like that about it, I must say. Even, the, even on the day that the beautiful Arab and Dediga took the prize, right in front of me, son of a bitch. I'm still in touch with him though. <laughs> he emails me every week to apologize. But uh, you know, even though I wasn't upset, I just thought this is part of the history uh, of, of my life, of my journey on the earth. I mean, I was, 
astounded in January, astounded. Like, I, I was reduced to about two and a half years old, Dolly being lifted out of the cart, vomiting in my face, <laughs> uh, by, by winning the Costa twice, because no one uh -huh. said you could do that. No novelist ever had in 30 years. Mm. So I would also say, you know, I love the Booker, but I prefer the Costa. <laughs> There you go, that's my answer. <laughs> and please don't quote me in any newspaper. Um, you kind of addressed this a little bit, but I thought I might ask a little bit further. Yeah. Uh, in your opening comments, you mentioned your grandfather and um, you mentioned troubling times. And I was just curious about what your personal motivations for talking about Tom or telling Thomas's story during the Civil War and the sure. antebellum period were and also maybe what's going on in the zeitgeist, because I'm thinking about your book, I'm thinking about Lincoln and the Bardo and the Underground Railroad, and what's maybe attracting authors to these stories about racial and cultural and political strife. Yeah, and isn't that very exciting that three different geezers in three different parts of the world were thinking some, somewhere along the same spinning mystery and feeling their way in, uh, into it. Yeah, my grandfather, you see, it, the book exists between two points, my grandfather and my son, who would never have met my grandfather. My grandfather in bed, in the room we shared, in a cold house in Dublin, many years ago, 55 years ago, me in the bed with him, because it's freezing cold, and Papa farting and saying, keep the heat in. You know, very, <laughs> very important detail of childhood. The bliss, the epic bliss of my farting grandfather. And, <laughs> He said in passing, uh, you know, my great uncle was at the Indian Wars. Now, he was a, had been a soldier in the Second World War, so he was interested in all that. So in that moment, I'm going to think about that for the next 50 years. What does that mean that a man like Thomas, who has been both complicit in and possibly a victim of colonialism in Ireland or his family for 700 years, even in a great emergency going to America, then involves himself in the destruction and diminishment and erasure of a people not unlike himself? That's to say, peop native people. I mean, it's a tragic thing to be in on this God's earth, a native person. Many, many years later, just as I'm beginning to think about starting the book, actually writing, the, I'm waiting for that first sentence. It's 2015. Toby, my son, 16 years old, uh, becomes extremely unhappy. And when your child becomes unhappy, you must mobilize yourself in grievous and extraordinary ways. You've got to know things you don't know. You've got to be the Sherlock Holmes suddenly of his unhappiness, because it could be something so small. Eventually, his sister, the aforementioned mixed martial arts and boxing correspondent, a metro online, but then at age maybe 20 or 18, uh, said to Toby, just go in and tell them. So we have quite a long bedroom, so for him to come in the door to reach our bed is a bit of a walk, and it's a brave and radiant walk and full of incredible courage. He comes up to the bed and he says, the thing is, Dad, this was the, after months of not sleeping, us and him, of worry, of tension, of fear, he says the words, the thing is, Dad, I'm gay. Well, if a l big hand had reached in and taken the lead off my back, I couldn't have felt more freed by what he said. And he looked freed. And from that moment onwards, he taught, as best he could, as the professor of gayness, his stupid straight father, what it is to be gay. We did our 20 hours with RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> and I have often said, and I've tried to say it as often as I can on NPR and elsewhere, if you wanted a reality TV star for a president, could you not have chosen RuPaul? Because <laughs> I think she's amazing. And I think those, those the drag queens are astonishing, because these are guys maybe in LA come up through shit in their lives, and they come out on stage under the tutelage of RuPaul you know, as sort of radiant, angelic persons. And it seemed to me transformative and important. And the more I looked at Toby, and then he fell in love with this lovely person called Jack, and the more I looked at that, and the quality of their love, and the intricacy of it, and their understanding of each other, it just not only because they're the same gender, but because they are transcendent people and saw how careful they were of each other, for each other, towards each other, I concluded, and it was just before the marriage referendum in Ireland, then, at the, at the end of my uh, university education by Toby, uh, I concluded that, you know, being gay 
we were being asked to tolerate gayness in Ireland, and vote yes for the marriage referendum. That's to say straight people were. Uh, and, and, I th and I thought, no, this is not about toleration. This is about reverence. This is something we must revere and try and emulate. Because there, this is a lesson in love. This is something that straight people, with all their cack-handed struggles with each other, opposite sex nightmare that we all went through when we were young. Do you remember? I mean, cast your minds back. Your first boyfriends or your first girlfriends, the mess of it, the, the World War I and two of it. Oh, my God. But this is something else. So a lot can be learned in, you know, in school, especially, um, about the, the transcendent, radiant nature of this. Now, then we had the marriage referendum, and we were on the cusp of it. And Toby wasn't quite 18, you know, so he couldn't vote. So what is a late middle age, possibly early old age, definitely early old age, Irish Catholic do? Well, I write a letter to the Irish Times. And I wrote a letter, a little letter about Toby and the referendum. I, I checked it with him first. He wept in my workroom. You know, and he is quite an extraordinary young man. He's, he's tough, but he wept. And I thought, maybe it's OK then. And it went viral for some reason. Uh, it went you know, retweeted till it was blue in the teeth. And then down in Australia, they read it out in the parliament. And suddenly, from that moment of Toby saying, the thing is, Dad, I'm gay, I realized that what he had done was actually give me back my life in a way. And not only my life, but also my work. So he becomes the muse of the work. That's why this is dedicated to him. And the referendum was passed. And Toby had said to me, Dad, if they don't pass this, excuse me, I'm, I'm not going to stay in Ireland, he said. So all that isn't just, you know, I'm starting a book that my grandfather has prompted 55 years before. And now I'm starting it with that illumination of my son 55 years later. And it wasn't that I put it in the book. It, the book just drew it in. And I suddenly had a sort of, you know, minor uh, uh, Wicklow Mountain vision of the two boys getting work in the saloon to dress as girls to, to dance with the miners because there's no women west of the Mississippi. And I actually saw them. And I thought, can you put that in a book? And I thought, well, I'm going to put it in my book. And the devil take the hindmost. And that whole thing in the book enraptured me. In fact, it was so joyous making this book that I thought it just couldn't be any good because you're supposed to suffer a lot more than that. And at Christmas time, I'd finished. I sent it to my editor at Faber, the, the, who published it in England. It's published here by Penguin, of course. And, and I didn't hear anything back for three weeks. So I thought, well, I was right. Too much fun. I'll, I'll write something else in January when I've recovered from the Christmas. Uh, uh, and then we'll be all right. Because you know, we educate them off this thing. What I hadn't realized is that Angus, my editor, of course, had three small children. Who's going to read a book over Christmas with three <laughs> small children? No man alive has achieved that. So then eventually, and then this sort of magic started. And I, I, and I will tell you here that the proudest moments of my life as a writer, I mean, it's lovely to win the Costa. It's lovely to miss the Booker by a vote. All those things are lovely. But to be at readings where, especially in the British Isles, just since I here only a few days, people have come up to me, you know, young people, both women and men who happen to be gay, and, and, and sh shaking my hand. I mean, well, I don't deserve that, but I took it as an enormous soul and heart accolade that I had meant that the book had meant anything to them at all. And one, one girl said online, she said, I'd ruined her life because unless she could find someone to love her, like John Cole loves Thomas and Thomas, then she wasn't interested in love anymore. So. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Just a little question. Oh, <laughs> you appear like angels. I greatly look forward to reading this book, but even more so, I wish you could move to my house and read it to me. Um, well, I, I have the whole <laughs> afternoon. Okay. I was only introduced to you this summer, and a friend sent me. Um, the Secret Scripture. Uh. And I'm sure you're asked a lot if you know the ending of your, you know where you're going as a writer. But specifically, did you know how this was going to end? Uh, 
I could write another book to answer that question, actually, but because it came up a lot. The ending was quite controversial in the end, at the close of day. Um, I don't know if anyone has read this book, The Secret Scripture. Um, yay! Um, um, <coughs> it was a curious matter, because everything for me is just personal. And the um, fact of the matter is that as I had started writing The Secret Scripture, which would have been, I think, a different book without this event, I discovered that my mother was in hospital. She hadn't said anything to me. Um, she was actually mortally ill, but of course she wasn't countenancing that, because she was going to live forever. And I was about a third of the way in to the book when that happened. And my mother and I had been a bit estranged, as people sometimes are. She a fierce and brilliant actress in the Abbey Theatre, her own woman. I think eternally 17, probably never wanted kids. Fair enough, that's fine. But when you are that kid, it's a bit difficult. <laughs> um, and I started to go into the, to the hospital to see her. Her first words to me were, what are you doing here? So it wasn't very encouraging. But anyway, I persisted, as you do. And I realized after a few weeks that there are cable, there's a cable of connection between a child and a mother that no human or, his or bulldozer can reach. Nothing affects it, really. Um, it's all the six foot above it, all the digging and turmoil. And there was an odd moment when the nurse said to me, your mother has no clean clothes. And I thought, well, don't you wash the clothes in the hospital? But no, you see, in Ireland, we're being good medieval people, you're supposed to take your mother's clothes home and wash them. Now, my mother, I, I, we lived like two hours from the hospital in the mountains. So, and my mother was a great Yeatsian person. You know, she, she was a great actress who loved Yeats' plays, which is a very unusual combination, let me tell you, because most people are, are afraid of, of Yeats' plays. And there's a lot of folding of cloth in Yeats' plays, which are very poetic things. Anyway, I would bring her clothes home. I remember the first time I did it. And um, I wept my way through this in, the la in our little laundry space, uh, washing our clothes, and then on the ground on my knees, folding my mother's clothes. Do you know? I mean, it's such an intimate and incredibly loving thing to do. It's nurse-like, which is the greatest calling there is. And put, put them back in. And I had puzzled why she was only always wearing the same raggy t-shirt in the hospital. And all those things ma made me think again and again that what we say to each other, what we do to each other, in the last analysis is unimportant. Like if there is a heaven, it's where that is washed clean. And the basic relationship is just um, the thing that explains life and why we persist with it. And I, I was sitting in my workroom. Dr. Green is the doctor in the book who is trying to look after Roseanne. And I just suddenly thought, oh, I know who you are. Because he was bothering the hell out of me, because he was very pedantic. <coughs> you don't want that sort of person in a book. I was wondering what he was doing there. I wanted to get him out of the book, to tell you the honest truth. And then I thought, well, oh, oh I see. I know who you are, yes. So I don't want to spoil the ending. And it, and it went from there. So I had to do a little bit of tucking back. But essentially, for the, and then my job was to, to hide that right to the end. To, to put the reader off the scent. Because in, in some ways, it's constructed like a crazy thriller. You know? And uh, I felt the ending would be a reward for the reader for all the hardship that they had read their way through. Do you know, it would be a resting point, a sort of gift. As I thought maybe, in a different way, the ending of this book might be, which I won't give away either. In fact, you know, it's not just the characters go through it. It's also the reader. And, and that's what I hoped, you know, would be. I mean, imagine my dismay and astonishment when people found it to be kind of soap op opera ending. Some people did go as far as to say Dickensian, which suited me, because I had actually been reading um, Bleak House. I mean, at the last few pages of Bleak House, the dog is related to the cat, the, <laughs> the ceiling is related to the floor, the, you know, I mean, everything, everyone's secretly related to everybody else. It's kind of wonderful. I thought that was worth another trot out in the world, too. 
So I guess that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Are we good? Yeah. Oh, one more. One. Sorry. Um, then we'll sign books. I've read uh, many of your books, and I, I really appreciate I wrote nearly all of them. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I think my wife actually knocks me out and writes them, but that's a different. <laughs> a different and one. I wanted to thank you for welcoming us into your fictional family. Oh, my and, joy. Um, uh, I appreciate it, uh, being Irish descent. And um, I was wondering if that was uh, deliberate on your part when you started with, I think it was Annie Dunn. Um, and the first one is Annie Smith, I'll see. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. oh, okay. So, so is, yeah. was it a deliberate um, conceit on your part, or did no, they you, just flow? <laughs> you couldn't and shouldn't underestimate the continuous and impenetrable stupidity that I enjoy in my brain. I had no big plan. All I'm trying to do is survive from one sentence to the other. Um, it has um, intrigued me and comforted me as a human being to try and get these people back. Uh, and I just, I just haven't stopped doing it yet. That's the way I look at it. But I mean, it, is, it has taken 20 years to make these seven books. And oddly <coughs> enough, that's the recompense too. You know, we were talking earlier about prizes. The fact that by some strange process, you, you've produced this little platoon of books, you know, and mm -hmm. somehow or other you can rest your heart against them. So, I mean, I don't, you thank me for writing them, I thank you for reading them. The hugest change for a writer in my lifetime is something like Goodreads, where you have direct access, well, unless Amazon has corrupted the whole bloody thing, but you have sort of, did I say Amazon in a bookshop? <laughs> um, where you have access to the opinions of, of you know, maybe five or six thousand readers, which is a huge privilege to realize that you know, people are engaging, maybe even attacking a book. So that, that it's not just you and your workroom. You know? and, and that is, um, I don't think any writer would uh, underestimate both the danger and the beauty uh, uh, of a readership. So I'm thanking you as the representative, as the ambassador of the readers <laughs> of this <laughs> town, I thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> right.